the secret of getting ahead is getting started i am tanisha gupta the host of today's webinar hello everyone and good afternoon to all of you i welcome you all in today's session hope you all are doing great on behalf of whole sems family i welcome you all on today's international webinar on the topic artificial intelligence oracle opportunity and way ahead add to our guest of honor and today's speaker dr pail b joshi we are really pleased by your presence artificial intelligence is a buzzword and has gathered attention in recent years due to advanced computing power ml a subset of ai has entered almost every domain of science and technology however there are some areas of science that is yet to be entirely explored this provides an opportunity for engineers to innovate and become social providers to scientific community in this talk we will explore the challenging areas of ml in science and their technical ways of enhancing before i proceed let me take a br brief moment for the introduction of my organization sims welfare foundation is a non for profit organization it promotes healthy lives balanced and active communities and strong business they work in the areas of education social welfare women empowerment skill development and entrepreneurship livelihood generation employability health and more our today's speaker is dr pail b joshi pail b joshi is the director operation at sefali research laboratories Mumbai she received her masters in organic chemistry in 2005 from Shrimati Chandi Bai H Mansukhani College after qualifying gate in 2007 she went to pursue her doctoral study and received phd in chemical science in 2010 from school of science nmi ms university mumbai she is currently serving as a director head operation and method development at cephali laboratories she is an affiliate member of royal society of chemistry and life member of indian pharmaceutical organization and california separation science society now i would like to give my heartiest welcome to our guest speaker mr pail b joshi over to you ma'am so yes, thank you tanisha riya aditya to be with me today and uh, before i share my screen i'll be just quickly sharing my screen before i start with uh, talking about artificial intelligence okay it stirs up a lot of emotions amongst all of us the very first thing is before i go ahead and i start talking to you about artificial intelligence and why i'm speaking with all of you today what was the prime reason of addressing on a topic which has become beyond a buzzword first and foremost is artificial intelligence has entered almost every domain of the industry now particularly my industry where we are currently working and the analysts who are working under me have been contemplating and we are we are actually developing certain technologies wherein we require some of the subset branches of artificial intelligence now let me tell you that though ai has entered almost every domain i'll be just taking out some part of it and i'll show you that how we are uh, trying to understand in terms of in my industry which is majorly talking about chemistry chemical sciences and food sciences okay so when you say food sciences is basically you're talking about chemistry and chemical molecules that are present in the food items or in the food constituents per se before i go ahead and go talk about artificial intelligence one thing is very sorted i believe that most of you are aware that artificial intelligence the minute you say it in amongst a general public they will say that okay they have seen this in the movie terminator which was way ahead of times when it was released i'm talking about the very first movie that was released uh, for uh, by uh, that was uh, featuring arnold and in that movie they had shown a cyborg a robocop uh, you could see self healing properties happening all over there so terminator i would say was uh, of course there were many of the movies that came prior to it i think that was one movie which really kind of is in alignment to what i want to talk about today okay it is kind of related to chemistry kind of related to chemical sciences now it is kind of whenever i talk to uh, talk about artificial intelligence i consider it as an oracle now why do i say oracle is oracle is 
a basically a greek term the genesis of that word is from the greek language it actually means that word actually means that we are uh, going to a temple and asking something okay for some information we want we always seek to a temple or a priest and we try to get some you know kind of resolution for our problems in our life so somewhere i think artificial intelligence is now working as an oracle of sorts for us for scientists and for researchers and for engineers as such as a whole so i consider it as an oracle today for us it also gives us lot of opportunities and definitely by the time it is 2040 we will be totally uh, be ruling with industry 4.0 that is a bigger revolution that we are seeing by the time we reach another 20 years is uh, over there before uh, going ahead i'll just uh, go on and uh, just okay now this is what i would say now where are we standing so you can see over here there are three stages basically what i can understand and let me put it this way that all of us whomsoever is right now talking about that they are working in machine learning in their industry or they are working in artificial intelligence are experts they are not they are all in the making we don't have people who are core machine learning uh, students coming into candidates coming in my lab we don't have them as yet we have computer scientists coming in our labs maybe some data scientists coming in our lab but definitely we are not having those uh, people in our lab who are core um, ai or they are doing core ai as such so at present where are we standing now this was the reflection that was given in 2016 that stage is machine learning second is machine intelligence and the third is machine consciousness machine learning is a part where we think that the machines can be taught they can be made to learn things machine intelligence is once that machines start learning themselves and machine consciousness is something that we are talking about self aware robots so once if they get the cognitive so there are three stages now the very first stage is the data driven uh, body that is the machine learning body where we require a lot of amount of data right machine learning is a subset of ai it is one of the branches of ai which requires a lot of data now i'll tell you something as far as my work is concerned i used to think that as a chemist or as a food scientist i i'm very good at generating data but when i started collaborating with machine engineers with the machine learners the engineers computer scientists they said that madam this data is not enough or this data is not reproducible so what is a good data that became a very big hurdle to how to give the best data how to give a good and a voluminous data to these scientists because they have to work with that data and whatever i give them whatever i feed in is going to come up so it is if i give garbage in it is going to be garbage out if i give a quality data in it is going to be quality out okay i want solutions i want to see if i have a molecule how can i interpret it so today i'll show you a very simple anecdote a very simple example from what a simple molecule i started and how i am actually looking at the basic premise of dealing with drug molecules and even pharmaceutical molecules that we are seeing at present in most of the pharmaceutical industries also so i'll give you some sh i'll share with you some one of that example and what we are uh, looking at consciousness is also something you won't believe that we are actually at that stage in chemistry where we have reached up to machine consciousness however one basic problem is not all countries are reaching at that level okay one point of note we have to keep in mind that when i say artificial intelligence it is not software it is hardware based it's all wired it can be tethered it can be untethered so we have to look at that as well right now uh, talking about machine learning now this is what is uh, you can see over here the cover image and this was somewhere in 2015 i can tell you what happened in my branch when uh, we were working towards it so 2015 actually shows us that already we had a lot of such uh, robo chemists that we had envisioned at that time so you can see uh, actually here what you're seeing is a graphic display of a robo chemist who is ha handling a separating funnel and they are working towards it so it was already there in fact 1955 onwards we are hearing about artificial intelligence for a very long time now it has caught attention now why it is catching up attention and how it is entering in my industry or in any industry per se is what we have to look at um so can machines think 
kind of you have to make them think at this present time are machines making us understand or we are making machines learn the, there are two different things of uh, putting it in context of machine learning now when you say you are making machines learn are you making them even understand no you are making only them learn right uh, understanding is not something that machines are at present in that um, you can say in that maturity to reach all right so how are we doing that are are they really understanding things so we have to mimic the brain you must have heard about neural networks and uh, convoluted neural networks so we are trying to basically mimic the human brain and when you are mimicking a human brain let it, let me put it this way if you understand the basic function of a brain you have so many neurons okay functioning and there are 10000 or more synaptic connections that is trans transmitting information from one neuron to the other the brain activity of a typical human brain is this way so biologically our brain is known to conduct or commit errors at the same time they are going to pass information due to conduction of ions mind it we have to understand the conduction of information in a brain is due to ions but when you talk about in a hardware the conduction is going to happen due to electrons which is far more faster and there is going to be an unprecedented error free zone when you talk about these kind of uh, machines which is purely working on the basis of chips so you basically have a chip you have a hardware and you are working on with those chips so when you are talking about machine learning when you are talking about ai when you want to extrapolate your machine learning facility to ai you want to automate your lab let us put it this way you have to mimic the brain and it will be faster definitely now i'll be talking about when you say that you want lot of hardware okay when you talk about now that i have been saying all this while okay we want to go wire free also if i'm gen, if i want to let us say after 10 years i want to start a lab i don't want say so many uh, you know rudimentary people in my lab and i just want some robot to do some job which i think the robot can do it error free if that is the case how am i going to make that robot understand how is that robot going to work in day and in night okay if the work that particular experiment or that thing has to work 24 hours how will i do that so today industry is thinking in that direction as well okay can advanced computational systems and ai improve scientific understanding in a two sense see there is a difference between scientific understanding and scientific discovery you can make a discovery even without understanding right that is again one of the uh, conversations that we were having uh, some over tea with some of my colleagues that how can you differentiate between scientific understanding and scientific discovery again can ai improve our understanding somewhere i feel today we can okay i'll be saying how it does it can ai perform and accelerate our fundamental research in our laboratory yes it's partly true that it can do it but all in all the essence in an essence i want to say that it does not at all bring out the context of replacing humans all this while that as i told you i repeat and reiterate my point here that ai stirs up a lot of emotions amongst public when i say that ai can you know they can do this ai can help us make us do that the robots can do this for us right it is going to replace human beings it's not really true as far as the industries are concerned it is not you are working in tandem together with these robots you cannot say that okay we are just going to completely be overtaken by these robots all that farcical representation that has been done it is very difficult i'll tell you why first of all it is not feasible to have uh, the complete takeover of ai based machines amongst or over human beings is because as i told you ai requires hardware and by the time it is 2030 2040 the amount of energy that has to be generated to run these ai based systems will be very high it will be unprecedented and to generate so much of energy to drive these computational systems to drive these ai based systems will be very difficult hence it is very difficult and i would say it is improbable to go ahead with already we are facing a lot of energy crisis so how would we do that that is really not possible at this juncture nobody knows what is going to happen 10 years or 20 years later but i can say one thing that energy 
is a bigger problem it is going to consume a huge amount tons and tons of energy and that is going to be a pretty difficult situation for the scientists so if anyone says if anyone is telling you that ai is going to you know uh, take over the world and something like that it is kind of fiction as of now but we can't really predict we never knew that uh, industry 4.0 is going to be this early and the reason why it is it's actually early if you see we actually predicted ai to start a little later maybe 24 or 2030 is what we expected that was a prediction but it happened kind of early thanks to the pandemic the reason was we were in complete search of vaccines at that point of time so it became very easy for us to go for ai we did not wait for the pharmacist to pharmacy scientists to come on the bench and do it for us basically that was uh, machine learning that was happening they were finding searching drugs Ideally speaking, if I look at it this way, artificial intelligence works in two layers. Okay, one you need is an infrastructure layer and one is the application. Layer. In the infrastructure layer is all that I have told you, right? You need data, you need storage, you need computing, hardware, uh, you need to have machine learning. So you should know all the languages, uh, that the computing languages that you have. You should know how to do the, these, uh, uh, you know, the Python and any other programming uh, you want to do, even the R programming, any kind of programming that you know, or you can upskill yourself. AI framework is very important. So you can develop certain kind of algorithms, uh, certain uh, mathematical data sets, certain decision-making layers can be made in this AI framework. Apart from that, there are three perception layers that one looks at when you talk about applying AI onto the context. It are They are based on the three different domains. One is the perception layer. Now, how it mimics, these are the three layers. This is how our brain mapping actually works. Perception, like how it responds to stimuli. So how I respond or how we as humans respond to stimuli, uh, to touch all the five senses, to touch, to smell, to feel. Okay, so all these kind of uh, vision is one of the perceptions again. Cognitive layer is the one where you reason. We are very good at reasoning. Okay, we are good. We are good at inductive reasoning. We are good at comprehension. Okay, we see something, we can comprehend the abstract thoughts. So cognition is something that we are looking at in terms of application of AI in fundamental sciences. Finally, once we assume that perception and cognitive layers are established, we can also go for decision making layer, wherein now using data science, using social science data. Can, they, can the machines make decisions? That is something that we are looking at. However, now where has it all entered? Where are these all applied? Perception layer, we are very commonly applying in terms of fundamental sciences, whether it is natural science, physics, chemistry, biology, and so on. Industrial manufacturing, uh, so mechanical engineering, additive engineering, you can go for. Daily life cognition. So if you have to do some menial job, dropping a delivery a mail uh, somewhere. So that's a daily life. So cognition. Can you do it? Can you navigate the pathway? Okay. That kind of cognition. Reasoning. Uh, comprehension. Reading a book. Okay. These are certain uh, areas where cognition has already entered. Once it enters the area of making decisions, that is the time we have to look at the social governance and the cyber security. These are the areas, again, which has an application when you talk about decision making by these robots, uh, self-created. So we have created that they should not turn into a Frankenstein monster. If I create something and now they are only controlling me, it should not so happen. So, but again, there is a, you know, a fiction that it may happen, right? But there has to be certain governance. We have to adapt to this decision making layer. Kind of a difficult uh, framework, I may say. Not for chemistry per se, but at present, we are looking at the cognition part. As I told you that uh, scientific discovery has got nothing to do with the understanding. You may not have any understanding, but you can still have a discovery. Ideally speaking, AI, if I talk about in science per se, you can have in three ways. One is the computational microscope. Second is resource of, aspira uh, of inspiration. And the third one is the agent of understanding, right? Now, in this case, you can see the computational microscope. Now, what uh, there are three ways of looking. This is how AI can decode how human brain works. You can have resource of inspiration and agent of understanding. Now, what do you mean by computational microscope? 
Now, if there is any data, let us say, for example, I have uh, a solid phase. Let us say we have water. Okay, water, we know they have three phases. It has solid, liquid, and gas, right? Now, let us assume that I've collected a lot. I've conducted a lot of experiments. I have a lot of data now. And from that data, I have... I have everything going as per plan, but there are certain irregularities in my data. Okay. These irregularities, if a human chemist is watching, right, they will assume that, okay, this is an irregularity. It is an erroneous data. We will have to either ignore it or it is some kind of, uh, you can say, a noise in my data and I will just ignore it. What here the ML does is, what the machine learning does is, it strives, strives, it tries to find a pattern in that irregularity. And what happens is from that irregularity, we come to know that there may be some unknown, maybe something that is unexplored phase of water. Maybe there is a fourth state of matter of water itself. This happens in case you want to go for computational microscopic technique. So it can provide an information not obtained through experiments. So finding some kind of irregularity from your data can happen in this context. Resource of inspiration. When you say science, creativity, insight, some kind of novelty, uh, some kind of surprise always awaits us. This resource of inspiration is always there amongst human brain, okay, to find some inspiration, to gather insight. We tend to think uh, and try to comprehend and try to find newer phenomena. This kind of thing also can be done by expanding the scope of human imagination and creativity. Until and unless you don't have intelligence and creativity, you cannot go to this domain. And I think here AI really plays a very crucial role. If AI can do something like imagination and creativity is something that we can really think about in a metaphorical sense, like in a mystical way, if it happens. So I think the phenomenon which is not known to us Say, for example, I do not know how the refraction of light happens. I think if they know, if the AI can find out some irregularity from that data, can let us know. So that is something that we can look for. Final is agent of understanding. So replacing the human generalization. Point of note here is humans tend to generalize a lot. Uh, we, take, uh, we take some kind of assorted data, some two, three papers. Let us assume we have taken, we have read two, three papers or scientific literature and we tend to generalize, okay. Uh, one says uh, hot dogs are uh, good. One says hot dog is bad. One says only the hot dogs of America are bad. So if I say something like this, what is my generalization? Hot dogs can be safer if it is e eaten outside US or America. So something like that. So we tend to generalize when we collect a lot of information. Now replacing this generalization into providing insights will be helpful in garnering insight into my data in an unbiased manner. All right, we have a lot of biases, we have a lot of errors when we think, when we try to provide insight, right? This is totally taken care of when you apply a concept of machine learning model, when you deploy a machine learning model onto a system to understand the chemical system, we can use agent of understanding. So AI works in these three facets. Uh, looking at, now I'll give you a simple example. First, I'll take numbers. Okay, I'll first take numbers and then I'll show you that how it is easy for computers and machines to understand numbers. They're very good with images, but they're very bad with chemistry. Okay, very bad with chemical molecules. So one thing is you have, let us say this is a number. It's a handwritten number, hand-drawn number, 9543. Okay, I take three. Okay, and I want the machine to understand three. So this is a handwritten picture, very easily identifiable to a human eye. Um, I take three. All right, I can make it into grid, right? So handwritten number can be broken down into a computer readable values, 12 by 12 grid, and is applied to generate 144 values ranging from zero to one, depending upon the amount of black in each one. So this is something that you can do. This is very easy. You can do it for the other numbers also. Same thing goes for images. If you have a, a photograph, uh, it's very easy to uh, make uh, make them into pixels, uh, bring them down to pixels and you can uh, gather all the artifacts. If there is any noise into your data, you get that pretty easily. It's very easy for computers to work in numbers. They're very good, fast with numbers. What about this? If I have a hand, now this is a hand-drawn uh, image of a molecule, a very simple, small molecule. And this molecule is paracetamol. Now this molecule was given and it was prescribed when the COVID vaccine was 
administered to the to the public and at that time they were saying that okay if you develop fever or something you have to take this uh, molecule okay so they take this over the counter drug this is your paracetamol now how will you make it adaptable to machine it's a three dimensional molecule how do we do this so i'll tell you that how do we do it basically we can divide this molecule now how do we do that now this is a hand drawn image i as a chemist know it's paracetamol now i have told you so you know it's paracetamol and a human chemist can identify because then this is a known molecule now, i'll talk about known molecule and then how we can go for extrapolating this understanding this information to a unknown molecule or to a molecule which could be a potential drug candidate maybe for cancer maybe for some other life threatening diseases okay so that's one question that comes into our minds now this is hand drawn i'll hand it draw hand draw it and give it okay let me know some information so this is a thought we played around with uh, we use something called as extended connectivity fingerprints now this is one uh, very common uh, kind of concept that we generally do it for smaller molecules what does a chemist do okay he will select a radius now let us understand now it will be kind of pretty difficult technically for you but i think we'll make it uh, easy for each other okay we will select radius and each atom environment along its neighbors within the radius uh, it is converted by the computer into integer we want values that carbon atom or the nitrogen atom we want it into numbers because machine will not understand carbon or nitrogen right we have to make them into numbers it is converted by the computer into an identifier we want values in uh, numeric values chemist will select a length for output fingerprint and the computer hashes the identifiers onto the fingerprint of a fixed length that chemist had select now this is useful if you are evoking an output of the same string length a bit length providing consistency no matter which molecule is entered into the machine ecp uh, ecfps that is your extended connectivity fingerprints are very commonly employed and we have seen this being utilized in in medicinal chemistry that is if you want to find out which molecule should i utilize as a or which as a vaccine or which molecule i am supposed to use as a steroid i need to know that so this is how i can pictorially show you okay what what does it say let us quickly understand this part i think this is very crucial for many people who assume that ai is not meant for chemistry now this is what we had played around and this is what generated from our uh, data now what we see over here is this is the molecule right now chemist will select the radius now i can say okay this is one zone i'll make circles okay this is the second circle and this is the third so i'll just take these regions right if i take this region i'll get many fragments okay i'll just fragments in the sense it is there is no chemical reaction happening here i'm just saying that okay i've taken this here who's the neighbor what is the environment every carbon has a different environment so i'll get all let us i will assume these are the fragments here and i'm getting all these identifiers here right all these identifiers this for maybe depending on how many diameters i'll get all these numeric values right on a fixed length of binary string is what i'm going to extrapolate i'll just allow the chemist to select an output fingerprint this all the computer does it for you the computer hashes the identifier to the chosen fingerprint length and all we have to do is we have to identify once we have done this okay once this is broken down okay once we have all this combinations done this is all done by the computer okay once we have done that once all that database is generated all that identifier is done we have a a clear cut algorithm which can be easily applied deployed onto our system right the only care that we'll have to take is when we generate this binary string okay now you can see over here there are certain places where the hashing of the computer will be more there will be more of folding of algorithms now when this thing happens there can be a chance that there are collisions we call them as bit collisions and i think computer scientists and computer engineers will be more aware of it so when you talk about bit collisions if happens in your data there can be a there can be a chance of loss of chemical information and we should as far as possible avoid these bit collisions one or two is fine but still when you want a reproducible and a good data we have to take care of that this is another problem when we go for large data right if there is any kind of bit collision in a chemical molecule it becomes kind of difficult to not lose critical 
information from the data set. Again, this has certain, before we deploy, we have to take care how many bit collisions have occurred, right? This is one thing that we have uh, seen. I have taken a very simple, small molecule to be precise. We have bigger molecules to work. So you can imagine the, the kind of expanse and the kind of database that we work on. So we have a lot of cloud-based data on which we do this. We have Postera Manifold on which we are working a lot, on which we can do all this kind of data analysis. So what are the key takeaways? I just wanted to quickly come to a point where I think this was one example that we have worked. The key takeaways for whatever I wanted to in short, whatever I could deliver, whatever I feel I can communicate to all of you. One is we are looking at fully automated industrial lab bench. Can that happen? Can we have a robot which can, you know, work day and night, right? It can find its path, okay? One thing I can say that most of the instruments that we are looking at currently uh, is basically, they're all the manufacturing also, because I have, I'm dealing with some of the manufacturers of these instruments. They do tell me that ideally these instruments are made in such a manner that only the humans can lift uh, the things. Okay, let us say I want to put a test tube in one of the racks. Okay, so it is very particularly precisely made so that the human can touch it. Because it's fragile, the glassware is fragile. So again, it becomes kind of difficult to give it to a robot, which is a hardware again. So if I have a robot, so how to very... Uh, nicely very uh, gently to hold these glassware in the lab becomes kind of a challenge that is uh, being looked at so they have to very gently pick up okay hold the glassware pick it up and place it right uh, secondly uh, one thing is very positive that it can work anytime because you have x-ray vision you have laser vision to work at only the thing is the ro robot has to navigate through the lab and work during the day, during the night also it can work and it can carry out more than 1000 experiments in one day, which I don't think it is absolutely humanly possible, which is taken care by these robots. There are certain laboratories where we are seeing this happening. University of Liverpool that is coming up with such kind of robots in, in their labs. They are very successful. If you can just Google out, you will find a lot of information in terms of robo, uh, robotic chemists in the lab. So you have University of Liverpool coming. University of Glasgow is working towards it. So I think the nations where they are getting a lot of funding in this direction, they are coming up with this. We are still, you know, snailing and you, we can say we can crawl towards that direction. Yet it's a distant possibility, but it is somewhere there. Next is, we want to develop an AI system which can actually make discoveries. Okay, as I told you, they want to, uh, I want a system in my lab which can make their own discoveries and should be an agent of understanding, right? I don't want to do even so much of understanding in terms of phenomena. Is there something that I missed out? Maybe my brain has some kind of a human error making and I do not know this is the phenomenon that actually occurred in my irregular data. Can any AI system do that? Difficult, but it is somewhere we have to look. Generating volume of data and that of high quality. This was a pre pressing problem with us when I was working with the team of analysts and uh, with the engineers. Now also, we, ha we have a teething problem of generating huge amount of data. Normally, when you say you have to get a data, you can just get it from the already generated data. And that is very, very rare, right? We can be, we as scientists can be very good data generators. But to process that data, to make something out of it, to decode that data, we need a complete collaboration, a complete understanding and deliberation with these computer scientists. And computer scientists also need to know what are the uh, challenges as a chemist that we face. Same thing, once I know what a chemical molecule is doing, I can easily extrapolate it to my food science uh, division I, where, with my people over there. Unified approach. We need a complete, there is no compartmentalization when we talk about AI. You have to work together. Uh, you need a team of scientists. You cannot say, you cannot work in silos. You have to come out with people, computer scientists, computer engineers, data scientists, and even scientific philosophers. I really want some people who are coming from philosophical background because they they are the one i remember two or three who were from humanities background they actually told me that there is a difference when you say a discovery and an understanding so i think these are small 
uh, you know, pointers that we have to keep in mind. We have to work in a unified direction. And finally, conducting, merely conducting competitions across the globe is not actually serving the purpose. I've visited some of the engineering colleges in the last two months and uh, there was some, um, some hackathon and something going on. Yes, we are seeing mechanical engineering people, uh, you know, engineers doing them. They are making some 3D printer, 3D printing technologies. And I went to some of the electrical engineering uh, division where they are making robots, right? But nobody is doing hardcore AI. Okay, this is kind of a situation right now in India. We are not seeing much of the AI that is happening per se. Let's see from here, how do we take out and how we are going to venture in that direction. So we will have to not mimic brain. We have to actually see what our Western counterparts are actually doing. They're way ahead. China is way ahead of it. Korea is way ahead in AI. So they are doing all these uh, kind of nitty gritties of AI. I have not seen anyone at present doing AI, basically. They are doing ML. Yes, uh, you have to first get into ML. That is, uh, I suggest most of the ones who want to enter industry, who wants to work in this area of science, and can help us in challenging problems. See, AI is an application. It is not a hardcore engineering branch or a hardcore, uh, you know, uh, science. It's something that can be applied. And if you can apply and solve my chemical problems, if you can solve our chemical uh, issues, I think that can take care of a lot. And that is what we are. At present, we are at ML. We are working with uh, machine learning. We are looking at machine consciousness also at present. So that will be all from my side. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful webinar. The session was very informative. Uh, we are grateful for the time and efforts you took to share your thoughts. So we will go ahead and take some time for the questions now. So, ma'am, so the first question is, what is machine learning and how does it uh, relate to AI? Okay, uh, see, one thing we have to say is AI is basically an umbrella. Okay, under which you have machine learning and you have other sciences and other learning. So machine learning is a subset of AI. That is what comes it, it comes under. It's one line, it's a subset, it's a category. It comes under AI. Uh, is Jarvis and Iron Man's suits practically possible? And uh, will humans become cyborgs in future if AI tries to kill humans? Okay, now this is a very interesting question. I think we have to really open our minds. If I can say, yes, partly true. Uh, there is something called as nanoelectronics. Now, my, one of our uh, colleagues is working in that area of nanoelectronics. So let us imagine this way. If I can hack the brain cell and uh, think about it in that context. Now, I'll just tell you, it. how will you do that? Okay, basically, there is a. there was one question asked by one of my former students was, ma'am, can we hack a brain and download a software, right? So I think uh, this is somewhere, I think if I have an unwired, untethered nanoelectronics entering into the cell at a subcellular level, if I make a very small nano sized within the cell, okay, and I can uh, have more of these cells, I can actually replica, make the replica of a brain cell and if they are untethered, I suppose we can do that. We can, in fact, have superpowers, if I may say. So yes, it is true. But then again, it's again a very difficult terrain to go for, right? But it is not impossible is what my... So I think nanoelectronics at the subcellular level, if we are... So you need a lot of biology here, okay? This is not a hardcore computers or it is not a hardcore... You need to know the biology of the brain cell per se. Yeah, and there's one more question from YouTube, ma'am, from Aman Kumar. Yeah. Ma'am, he, mm -hmm. he is asking that is automation harmful for the human employment? Okay, I can understand the concern. Yeah, um, yes, automation is going to be a reality very soon, and we have to look at where does India stand at present. As far as employment is concerned, I can understand the genesis of this uh, issue. Uh, I think we all at this point of time, I don't want to give, I don't want to sugarcoat this uh, answer pertaining to employment. I would say as far as industry is concerned, we are actively hiring at present. As far as chemical industries are concerned, if you have upskilled yourself, I would suggest to all the uh, students whomsoever may be listening to us, who may be working 
uh, towards uh, getting some job into a corporate or into an industry i would say that we all need to upskill irrespective of in which field or in which domain you belong to we want uh, not just engineers we want even uh, as i told you we even want people from the humanities from psychology i would say that even we want people from psychology today it's uh, it's completely it's the education is so uh, compartmentalized but industry is not like that we are very fluidic we want uh, engineers we want philosophers also when we are solving a problem we need psychologists coming long story short to your question automation is not going to destroy the jobs is what i would say robots and automation is going to work in alignment with the humans okay you cannot completely eradicate a chemist and work in the lab what if the robot itself is erroneous okay it can happen you need people to at least function with those uh, automated techniques long story short i can say we all need to upskill ourselves in this era of industry 4.0 definitely will not need a uh, 50 plus workforce but definitely it is going to bring a significant dip and significant decline in uh, employing Uh, the humans at at present at uh, as a for uh, as a future is what i can see but they will not destroy but definitely it can uh, you can work in align at present you can work in alignment we are not uh, downsizing uh, at present definitely and if there is any downsizing that happens that is all because of the financial constraints of the company or some budgeting constraints uh, you, you are into bankruptcy so at that point you have to really think about downsizing your workforce ma'am there is an, another question yes if automation is going to be reality then what is left for man progress of daily life retired life or philosopher's life with grooming where we are no 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 nothing that's not it's a very poetic question i must say okay uh, i think automation is taken very uh, you know it's like a black box right now i may say we really don't know where we are heading at present uh, in india i may say but definitely uh, we are not going to be redundant okay we are not going to be uh, uh, totally wiping away the requirement of human race and the humans have to only be poetic and be philosophers in the future no definitely not automation is there definitely it is going to be but it is not definitely wiping out the entire uh, requirement of the human race is what i can presume i need people i cannot talk to a robot 24/7 in a lab <laughs> that's for sure i need a human contact we need that human contact in industries for sure at present and definitely at least for the next 10 15 years i cannot see that happen ma'am we have one more question yeah please please with automation and ai do, uh, do women needs new preparation for daily life and job wise a culture um yes i think you need that that will be a requirement Uh, you have to first of all though as i told it, it is kind of related to one of the questions that i was talking about in automation you have to kind of upskill yourself you cannot say that i belong to a particular uh, domain if you want to be relevant and i think most of the questions are actually having the spirit of getting a job and to make a career uh, and if you're doing that definitely you have to upskill yourself you cannot say that i belong to a particular domain of biology and i'll be getting into some particular uh, job and that's done banking is going to get redundant very soon i think that is one sector where i can uh, actually see as far as industry if i may say i'm i'm pretty good at talking about the industry where i work i really need people so that is definitely uh, something that we always look for automation as i told you again i will not uh, go again into that zone but yes in 10 15 years we can look at a downsizing of uh, workforce that may happen and let us be prepared for that we cannot do anything about it we want fast technology we want answers that was effective i hope so thank you ma'am for answering all the questions thank you i want to thank tanisha and riya and aditya for helping me out and a special thanks to sens foundation and mr atul garg for giving me an opportunity yet again to join your fantabulous team and a completely a seamless activity that we had in these months of time thank you so much ma'am it was a great pleasure to have you with us thank you thank you ma'am thank, thank you, you. Ma great thank you everyone we appreciate you being here thanks again for joining us today and we will see you next time thank you ma'am thank you